for the first part of the talk, I will give you a big bit of a background about the project itself, but the whole project, the concept, and the and the approaches of ourselves and of course um, of our um, colleagues. And in the second part of the talk, I will focus on our task, which is the use of process-based models to understand the process underlying mixtures, mixture performance, but also to quantify ecosystem services. So who is we? Um, Thomas Döring and myself, we helped to write the proposal. And there were also two colleagues, uh, Murilo Jena from, from Top Science, from our group, and also Nicolas Brogemann, who uh, support the project as scientists, and we have also employed a PhD student, who is Pascal Winton. The project is financed by the EU Horizon program, and its name is Intercrop Values, which stands for Developing Intercropping for Agri Food Value Chains and Ecosystem Services Delivery in Europe and Southern Countries. So in short, it's about intercropping. Um, you may have realized that we in funeral use another term, which is crops, uh, crop mixtures, or just mixtures, but it's just a synonym, synonym for um, intercropping or intercrop systems. That just means that you grow more than one crop at a field at the same time. We are 27 partners in that project, uh, plus some affiliated and associate partners, uh, China, for instance, and a few African countries. Uh, we have a budget of about 8 million euros, and the project uh, with its duration of four years started last autumn. I'll give you some background about the general concept. So the idea is actually um, the, um, an ecological identification of agriculture in the EU, but also in African countries and in China, using the concept of intercropping. And we are not only agronomists in the project, but we are. Uh, there are also a lot of other uh, disciplines, people from with other disciplines, and we have also we are also following a multi-actor approach. That means we consider the whole value chain, we consider the socio-technical system as a whole, we consider the societal um, demand, also the nutrition, demand for nutrition, and we aim to identify lock-ins of um, intercropping. So why is intercropping actually not really widespread? How can we overcome these lock-ins and how can we access new markets? And then the, the fourth um, key concept is the analysis of multiple ecosystem services and this, this services. This is where we focus on as the University of Bonn um, together with Nicolas. So as I said, we follow a multi-actor approach. That means we do research with and for stakeholders and we want to address the societal demand and uh, by addressing key challenges such as the loss of biodiversity, the demand for food or the climate change. And you may have heard about the, um, you may have heard the FAO paradigm from, from farm to fork. And in our project, we want to inverse this paradigm. So we want to find out what is actually needed by the society, what is needed and how can we produce that um, from the farm. So we want to use actually uh, from the form to a uh, from the form, from the fork to farm approach. Hereby, ecosystem services and this service play a very important role. And um, we, uh, we follow a multi-criteria assessment of these ecosystem services with a diversity of methods. So we use um, experimental data. We conduct a lot of experiments with intercrops to assess these ecosystem services, but we also calculate a bit more simpler indices and we want to use um, simulation models. And of course, there are always ecosystem services and this services of agriculture, and we want to find a balance, I want to find a balance to have an optimal cropping system at the end. This is the structure of the overall project. Uh, the project is led by Eric Schuss from CIRAT in Montpellier, France. They are also coordinating and managing the project. And then we have um, several other VPs work packages, one of them, which is quite, quite nice, quite interesting, are the so-called co-innovation case studies, KICS. I will give you a few examples of it later. Then VP2, um, in VP2, we'll conduct um, several META experiments all over Europe and Africa. I will also say a bit more about that. 
we will um, also assess other, um, yeah, go beyond the standard measurements. We will also assess um, greenhouse gas emission measurements. We will use, we will measure soil health, and there will be also some machinery studies included. And then on the um, left, there is VP4, which is on modeling, which is the work package I'm leading. It's about understanding the processes underlying interperformances, and here we use modeling approaches. I have made this red frame about these three uh, work packages because we as the University of Bonn focus on these, and we mainly work on these four, uh, on these three work packages. And then there are all, uh, two uh, further ones which are quite interesting, which is uh, VP5, which focuses on post harvest quality and food processing. So they also want to, to um, observe the differences in of the grain quality of crops that were grown in soil conditions and soil conditions or in intercropping. And then there's also VP5 that want to, to find out what are the main logins and how can uh, we transfer these logins to opportunities and how can we open new markets. Then of course, we have also um, a team that works on communication and dissemination of the project. So as I've said, there are several um, experiments um, and we aim to have uh, meta synthesis of, um, we, have, we have already a network of experiments. Um, there will be 15 experiments in total over whole Europe, including Africa, Southern Africa and China. And the, um, we want to assess the intercom performance of a large um, gradient of phytoclimatic conditions. For that, we have a common protocol, that means we do we have a few treatments that all of us do, do conduct or do um, conduct in their experiment. We have um, defined the crops we want to grow, and we have also um, defined measurements all of us want to do. Then, of course, we will do a G10, G10, B10, M analysis, um, considering not only the different genotypes, we will also test them with the genotypes, but also um, management. In that case, we focus on nitrogen, so we will have different nitrogen fertilization levels. And then, uh, some of these, um, in some of these experiments, we will also measure um, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, what is quite interesting, interesting in that um, experiment, uh, we will also conduct one in Campus Ten Altenhof. By the way, it will start this year in in April. We will not only measure the intercrop performance on the year where it's calculated, but we also want to focus on the fellow period after the harvest and on the following crop. And in, during all this time, we want to measure also the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just focus on one year, but the uh, effects on the whole crop rotation. Here are some example, examples for B specific cereal legume mixtures that we will cultivate. So we will have in, in Africa, especially sunflower soybean, um, as you can see here on the left side in a strip intercropping design, that means you have um, strips that are more than just one row. So in that case, we see two or more rows of distance. Then in the middle, you can see a row intercropping where there's just one row, in that case, of fava bean grown into cereal. And on the right side, there is an in-row mixture um, I guess most of you know the experiment from Maduri and Thomas at Kamskan Adenov that was quite similar, but in our case in CKA it was um, Parvatin and spring wheat. And then um, there are the so called co innovation case studies or kicks. There are 13 of those. And um, each of these kicks, they have a defined topic uh, they are working on. They are, let's say they are addressing a certain problem they have when growing, when growing uh, inter or when conducting intercropping or, or within the whole value chain. And they are um, organized in a network of the kicks and they're exchanging knowledge and information. And currently they are meeting in Italy to discuss uh, problems and, and solutions for intercropping. So they all use a similar methodology, methodology, but adapted to the value chain of their country. Um, let me give you two examples so that you better understand what I mean with these um, case studies. For instance, there are on the left side, there are five German bakeries. Um, you can find them at uh, on the backwerk.de. 
And the main objective of these of this kicks or these five German bakeries is to um, to see if intercropping improves the wheat baking quality. And they want to use or they want to integrate intercrop wheat into mills and bakery and want to find out also if they can can sell this products like wheat uh, um, um, breads for instance from intercrop wheat if, it, if the customers are interested in buying such a product if they are valorizing actually that it's from intercrop field and there are also some challenges. Uh, one of the main challenges they have is actually the purity standards, um, because there are sometimes there is a foreign matter, or there's there could be more foreign matter in the intercropped wheat because of small particles of crashed bean seeds. And they also aim to develop a new protein product from the legume that is grown with the wheat in the intercropped system. And then there is another um, kicks. Um, as you can see here on the right side, 14 French farmers, organic farmers, they are looking for a solution to sort the harvest products because, as you may have realized, also Thomas can argue, it's not so easy to separate the, the grains from the two crops after harvesting. And their objective is to develop sorting machines and to exchange knowledge and equipment on that. Then there is the work package on modeling, where we aim to understand the processes underlying intercrop performances, and we use four types of models. Um, first of all, we want to use a so-called 3D functional structure plant model to um, identify ideal types. Then in the middle, we want to use a process-based uh, soil crop model, um, similar to those that we use in, in our group, in Frank Ebert's group, to quantify biomass, yield, and ecosystem services, including um, gas, greenhouse gas emissions. And what's different to what we are doing here in Europe is that we also use, we also want to apply a, a wheat model to, to um, quantify the performance of um, mixtures regarding wheat suppression and uh, epidemiological model that considers aerial diseases. And I would like to finish the first part of the talk on the whole, on the project um, as a whole, by giving you an idea about the overall goals of the work packages on modeling. So what you want to do is to understand, to better, uh, to, to improve our understanding of the G times G times G M interactions and crop mixtures, um, with a focus on water, nitrogen, and fruits. This is what we are also doing in Finnerop already. However, here the focus is much more on nitrogen and also on gases emissions and uh, the effects um, in the second and the third growth period after the mixture. Then we want to optimize uh, intercrop systems in terms of phenotype combination and feed design and management. That is what we're also doing here in Finnerop. And thirdly, we want to study the mechanisms um, like um, resource efficiency, with what we also do in Finnerop. But here we go a bit beyond because we also want to consider diseases and disease and pest avoidance and product quality. And last but not least, we also um, want to use models to assess the yield stability and robustness of intercrops versus solid cropping to climate, climatic, uh, climate change and climate variability. In Finnerop, we focus on a few sites here around Bonn, and in that project, we focus on uh, uh, yeah, well, on, on much more, um, much more sites, including um, African sites. With this, I would like to come to the second part of my talk, which is the focus we have in that project. We want to use models, process-based models, to better understand um, mixture performance or intercrop performance, and we want to quantify ecosystem services. So what are ecosystem services? First of all, there are ecosystem services and disservices to agriculture. Uh, you can see them on the left side, which are um, climate and air regulation, um, water provision, soil provision, the pollination, um, pest regulation or genetic diversity. And there are also disservices, for instance, pests and diseases that can come from outside and enter into the field. But there are also services and disservices from agriculture. Um, the most important one, of course, is the production of food, fodder, and fiber. But also um, other products for the uh, bioeconomy can be produced. 
Then there's some um, carbon sequestration um, taking place in agricultural soils, partly also biodiversity conversation, and also um, many people like uh, the landscape of agricultural science or crop lands. There are also disturbances from agriculture, like the loss of biodiversity and wildlife habitats, water pollution, erosion, pesticide poisoning, or greenhouse gas emissions. And um, what we want to find out is actually how, how farm management, which we can influence, like the, the, the tillage or the choice of the species or the cultivar or the feed design or the crop rotation, or if we include cover crops or not, how this um, farm management can have an influence on services and this services from agriculture. And for that, we want to use models. And as you may have learned already from, from talks from, from Thomas During and Maduri, in general, there is a positive effect of intercropping on crop performance, but this varies a lot. So the benefits vary a lot depending on, on the site. And the many other factors, the, the, the crops you combine, the, the, the feed design, and so on. And the performance is influenced by a lot of complex factors. So it's, it's um, a very complex system, actually. And uh, we want to use the process based models to, to find optimal intercropping systems, but also to quantify the system services. Um, I, pre I prefer prepare a few slides on process-based crop simulation models. Some of you may have uh, heard that already from, from Frank Ewald, Oleg Schell, or myself, so it could be a bit boring for some of you, but some others may not really know what I'm talking about. So um, in the following slides, when I say model, I mean so-called process-based uh, crop simulation models, which are which are dynamic tools that simulate the growth and the development of crops in, in relation to the environment. So in, the, in relation to the, the, the weather, soil water, uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations and so on, but also in relation to management practices, for instance, sowing dates and nitrogen fertilization applications or crop procedures. And to run a model on a certain site, you need um, so-called, uh, you need a model input data, which is for instance, weather data, information about the soil properties of the site, information about the cultivar and the management. And then the model can simulate several processes. Um, here's a list of some quite important ones like the phenological development, the light interception, interception and utilization, the root growth, evapotranspiration, and soil water and soil nutrient dynamics. And then you get specific outputs such as the phenological development or the biomass growth or the nitrogen leaching or the water nitrogen uptake or greenhouse gas emissions, which you can then use to quantify ecosystem services. So um, the models we, we uh, use are actually contain equations of principles of agronomy. All of them are not mathematically challenging, I would say. So usually they are just simple functions or simple relationships, um, such as on the top left, the relationship between photosynthesis and radiation interception, or at the bottom, the so-called critical N concentration curve, which is the relationship between uh, shoot nitrogen concentration and shoot biomass, or on the top right, the relationship between crop development stage and the sum of temperature over the growth period. I would like to give you one example on how how uh, one how um, biomass is calculated, for instance. So um, the potential daily biomass accumulation is uh, the is uh, calculated by multiplying as uh, crop specific light use efficiency with the intercepted photosynthetic active radiation, and the latter depends on the incoming radiation, which is uh, comes from the weather data. Um, a crop specific extinction coefficient and the actual LAI, which itself is also calculated within the model. The models usually consider stresses. Um, almost all models consider drought stress, and most models consider nutrient stress, stress, especially in nitrogen. Some also consider phosphorus and potassium stress, and the models also consider temperature stress, so cold and um, hot temperatures. And then if a stress occurs on a certain day, this, the major stress um, reduces the increase of biomass on that specific day. 
So after one day, you have a certain uh, created a certain mass of biomass, and this biomass is then partitioned into the different crop organs, so into the roots, the stems, the leaves, and the storage organ. And this partitioning is also defined by the model. So there are specific um, crop specific um, partitioning tables that also depend on the development stage. Here is a scheme of um, the models. So if you want to run a model on a certain site, you always need the soil properties of that site, you need the weather data, usually on a daily basis of that site. You need some information on the management, so one, when did the sowing take place, or when was the fertilizer, fertilizer application, and how much fertilizer was applied, and so on. And um, the uh, crop, crop models come with so-called crop parameters, these are usually default parameters. So for instance, they characterize a standard common wheat, winter wheat of um, Central Europe. And if you have a crop or a species that is not, uh, is a bit different, like it has a different harvest index or, or maximum height or whatever, you can adapt this, um, the model to your um, parameters by calibration procedure. So let's come back to the ecosystem services and the following. I would like to give you an example how we can use the model to, um, uh, to simulate the effect of different genotype choices and feed design on the ecosystem service food production or grain yield and carbon sequestration. For that, we will um, change the crop parameters um, to, to, to um, show you the effect of genotype choice. We will we will change some crop parameters, as you will see in the following, and to change the management, we will, or, or to reflect the feed design, we will change um, the management. In this case, we will change the sowing density. And in our approach, we want to use, make use of all the experimental data uh, we can have. So it's not a synthetic study, which is, of course, also possible, but here we want to use um, all the feed experimental data we have. And um, I don't want to go into detail. I'm sure um, some of you have already heard talks from, uh, from Maduri or from Thomas about the experiment and CKA and Wiesenhut, just to give you a very, very rough overview. Um, we conducted a feed trial in three environments. That means um, what we consider here is um, two years of experiment at Campus Can Altenburg and one year of experiment at Wiesenhut. And at that trial, we tested two faba bean cultivars and 10 spring wheat cultivars, both of them grown under two soil densities. And we have always the pure crops, so just wheat and we have, uh, or just bean, and we have then in grow mixtures, a combination of the two um, wheat and faba bean. And here are some key outcomes now only focusing on plant height. So um, in general, there was a wide range of height, maximum height in wheat of about 20 centimeters, but we had only um, two fava bean varieties and the difference of these two cultivars in terms of height was um, not so large, it was actually just five centimeters. And as you can see on the bottom right, there was a correlation between plant height and grain yield, but it was not very strong. So we, this graph here on the, um, on the bottom right, the scatter plot on the left shows bean height over bean uh, biomass. And you can see that there is a weak correlation. The higher the bean, uh, the taller the bean, the larger the grain yield. And on the right side, you can see the relationship between bean height and a wheat grain yield. And you can see that there is a relation or there is a negative, negative relation. And so the taller the bean, um, the lower the wheat yield. So we will use a um, modeling approach and, the scenario, and do scenario analysis. In that case, um, we use an um, intercrop model that considers competition for radiation depending on the height difference between the two crops, but also on the coverage of both crops, which itself depends on the sowing density. And the model also considers the competition for soil water and for soil nitrogen. And this is some preliminary work or some work from Derecher, from, from Finora, because as I have said, the EU project started just two or three months ago. So we are not, didn't do so much already on that, of course. 
And uh, this is where I will show some, some work from Derrache, but to, to explain, to give an overview on the approach. So what you can see are here some results of um, calibration where you can see um, on the top biomass and on the bottom uh, um, photosensitive active um, radiation with the blue lines are simulation outcomes and the red crosses are observations. So um, we calibrated and validated the model based on the three environments and the soil cropping and we, no, so sorry, we calibrated it based on sol solid cropping data and we validated it against the mixture data. And since we have the data only of three environments, but we want to know more about uh, how, how, um, how we can, uh, how stable are the yields um, under these conditions, or also under other weather conditions, we use the so-called um, weather stochastic weather generator. And this stochastic weather generator generates daily uh, weather data based on the observed data. So let's say, for instance, we have 20 years of um, daily weather data from Campus Can Adenorf, and then you generate 100 years of, um, of weather data with exactly the same statistical characteristics. But you increase the um, you increase the amount of years to make to allow not only twenty but one hundred simulation runs. But so this is not a um, climate change study. You use just the recent weather data and recent um, climate conditions. And I was showing the following some example outcomes of the effect of heat design and management on the LER. The LER is um, a measure that is quite often used to, to, to quantify the intercropping performance. It stands for land equivalent ratio. And the LER is the sum of the P LER of crop one and the P LER of crop two. So P LER stands for partial land equivalent ratio. And the P LER itself is um, um, calculated by dividing the yield of the crop in the intercrop by the yield of the crop in the soil crop. So let's say you have, for instance, um, five tons of yield of wheat in the intercrop divided by 10 tons of yield of wheat in the soil cropping, you get a PLER of 0.5. And if this is the same for the legume, then you end up with the LER of one, which means that you have not really gained anything because you needed as much land surface or area for cultivating these two crops um, in, in the intercropping as compared to when you just put it separately into two fields. But what you usually have is a PLER that is above uh, 0 0.5. Let's say you, you yield, for instance, uh, six tons uh, in the intercrop and 10 tons in the salt cropping. Then you end up with an LER that is B above one. And then you have a positive effect of um, intercropping. And um, there are a lot of meta analysis on that LER value and um, so roughly, roughly the um, LER on these in these meta studies is about um, um, 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2. So you need 10 or 20 percent less area when you crop when you when you um, cultivate these crops in intercropping as compared to soil cropping. So I explained this a bit in detail to you because um, all of the results to be shown now are showing the LER or the PLER of the two um, crops, bean and wheat. So all of these, so the, the um, green box plot shows the bean PLER, sorry, the red one shows the bean PLER and the green one the wheat PLER. And the sum of the two of them is then the LER, which is shown, shown in blue. And if it's above one, then you have a positive effect. And each of these um, box plots now is the result of 100 simulation runs um, using the data from Campus Can Altenor, the soil and the weather data from Campus Can Altenor. And what we show here is the effect of sowing density or different sowing density combinations on the LER of grain yield. And on the x-axis, you can see that this is the beam, a wheat and bean percentage, um, which shows, for instance, 50-40 means that you have 50% of wheat on the feed and 40% bean. The next one is then 50-50, 50-70, 50-60, 50-70, and so on. So always the, the bean, um, the bean sowing density increases while the wheat um, density stays the same. 
And the result is that the bean PLER increases, but the wheat LER decreases. And in total, you can see that there is there is some effect on the NER, but it is not very high actually. Here are two other examples um, on the effect of the burnt genotypes of L on NER. On the left side, it shows the effect of plant height combinations, um, where you can see um, the relationship of bean and wheat height. So on, on the very left, you can see, um, first of all, that scenario, the maximum bean height is 100 centimeter and the maximum wheat height is 50 centimeter. And then the next one, again, bean height is 100 centimeter and wheat height is 50 centimeter and so on. And you can see that with increasing uh, wheat height, the wheat PLER increases, whereas the bean PLER um, decreases over time. And in total, there's an increase of the LER. And then on the right side, we tested different maximum routing depth combinations. And um, um, without going into detail, but you can see that there is a very high impact of the maximum routing depth on the grain NER. The reason of this for this is actually that um, if the root maximum rooting depth is very shallow, then there is a lot of um, water and also nitrogen stress, which has, of course, a high impact on the NER. And here we have some, some preliminary outcome on how you can, uh, how, on the variance of the NER, depending on the different plant traits and management options. Uh, for these scenarios for the campus can Altendorf. And in that study, um, we compared all the yeah, observed different sowing densities, sowing dates, then maximum rooting depth, plant heights, and extinction coefficients, um, which have to do with the light interceptions. And we see that all factors influence, especially the partial NER and not always the um, total NER. And we also found out um, that the maximum rooting depth is very important for the NER. Um, I have one more slide, which is on the um, carbon sequestration. Actually, I refuse to, to call it carbon sequestration because carbon sequestration means that the carbon, the carbon stays in the soil forever. Um, what we do is actually, we want to quantify the, the root-based carbon input into the soil at that moment. And this is a much more challenging um, topic than the, the yield. And um, we do we quantify we use a quite a similar measure in the NER, which is to do the same calculations, but for the roots or the different soil depth. And what we did in one year is we took a soil cores and quantified the root biomass and root length density within the mixture. So by, and we used we used um, FTO spectroscopy to differentiate between the two species. And uh, we did that for some of the treatments and on the Bottom left, you can see the result of um, um, the, the uh, overyielding of roots per, per soil layer, so from zero uh, from surface until one meter depth. And each bar shows the overyielding in that layer due to the um, mixture. And we have here on the left side a very um, super dense treatment where we have a lot of bean and uh, a lot of bean and uh, wheat plants on that side. And there we observed a negative root um, mixture effect and under this very really high sowing density. And then on the right side, there are two examples where we have, uh, let's say, a more normal um, um, sowing density of 60% wheat and 60% uh, bean. And you can see here that there is definitely a strong overheating in the root. That means you put more root carbon into the soil when you grow the two plants together as compared to the soil crops. And we have we done some very preliminary um, simulation runs um, where we want to find out if the model is able to um, represent this finding. And on the left side, you can see the results for the very high density case. And, and this looks quite similar. This the pattern looks quite similar to what we found um, in the observation on the very left side. So there is a bit of overyielding on the top and a bit of overyielding in the lower layers, but there is in general a negative. Um, effect of mixture of the mixture on the on the root over yielding. Whereas on the right side, on the very right side, the bar, uh, the plot shows the over yielding uh, for the for the other sowing density 60 60 percent. And here the model um, definitely I means tendency is itself 
more or less okay, but the model definitely underestimates the overheating of the roofs. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, in my talk, I try to explain you, give you an overview about the new EU project, Intercop Wellness, which has, uh, which is a very uh, interdisciplinary and multi-actor um, project with a focus on nitrogen dynamics and ecosystem services and intercropping for mixtures. And the focus of the people um, of, of us, um, people mainly from the University of Bonn, will be on the application of process-based models to better understand the processes in intercropping, to find optimal site-specific tree designs, and to quantify ecosystem services and visitors. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>